Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming back and joining us at the end of today. I see more and more people are coming in. I've put everyone on mute for now. Um, I know people are, are drifting in from their other workshops. I hope everybody had good workshops and good discussions this afternoon. Wave, thumbs up if you did. <laughs> Ours was so exciting that we had a hard time. We had a, we had a hard time finishing in time to start this one because there were just so much discussion, so much fruitful discussion. So we're really grateful for that. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, there we go. Can everybody see that? Wave if you can, nod, wave, great, great. Okay. So thanks again for joining us. And if you have comments um, and um, greetings and so forth, feel free to put them in the chat, that's fine. We are again joined by our captioner, Stacy from Canadian Hearing Services. So she's gonna put um that in the chat as well um i would like now to turn it over is lisa is lisa there lisa if you would unmute yourself i'm lisa here Turner. yes you I'm are here. great yes wonderful lisa if you would like to lead us in the in the opening prayer please it would be my pleasure. Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new and that all things are bring, being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Um, amen. Okay, I would like to, sorry, Wendy, can you unmute yourself? Sorry, you will have to unmute yourself, Wendy. Are we good? Yes, we're good. All righty. How's everybody feeling? Great. I am so pleasured to be here with you. And uh, we just want to praise the Lord because he has done so many wonderful things for us. The song we're going to do right now is open the eyes of my heart, Lord, so you can see us. And while you're sitting, you can do a little clap. Just put your hands together. We want to see, Lord. So Thank you. 
my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. His amazing grace, his unending love has brought us to where we are. So our chains are gone and we've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, his mercy will reign on ending love, amazing grace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy and Daryl, for that lovely testimony. We are now going to move to um, our Faith Works moments. And um, in our Faith Works moments, we, they were inspired by the missional and outreach moments that we have at Diocesan Synod. And we've invited a number of our Faith Works partners, and especially those who work outside the GTA, to share with us some of what they've been doing. And I'd like to ask if Leslie Rice would, um, would start us off with a, a word from Aurelia Lighthouse. Leslie. Thank you, Elin. I hope you can hear me all right. All right, hello, my name is Leslie Rice. I am a member of St. Athanasius Church in Aurelia and a volunteer at the Lighthouse Soup Kitchen and Shelter, also in Aurelia. St. Ace Church has been a supporter of the Lighthouse for years, providing food, finances, time, and talent. Personally, as a Lighthouse volunteer, I can't say enough about the work that is being done in support of those who find themselves on the street and sometimes without hope. To hear the excitement in a client's voice when they tell you they've found employment or are moving into their own apartment, what a time for celebration. The Lighthouse of Faith Works Ministry Partner is named as such because our goal is to guide the vulnerable out of life's storms, provide physical needs such as food, clothing, and shelter, give spiritual hope based on Christian beliefs, and point the way to wellness by connecting and anchoring our clients into the community with permanent safe housing. The need to support the hungry and homeless in the Aurelia area continues to grow. And the current shelter facility, a small aging century old home with 14 beds for men is not meeting the identified needs of those seeking help. Fast forward to Building Hope. The Building Hope campaign seeks to fill the current service gap by providing a new space open to anyone regardless of age or gender. The Lighthouse Community Services Hub will serve Aurelia's vulnerable, offering a range of housing as well as emergency food and shelter, primary care, mental health and addiction services, and spiritual support for people who are experiencing a housing crisis. Our goal is to promote overall wellness for individuals and families and help alleviate chronic homelessness, addiction, and poverty. Construction is well underway and the opening of the new Lighthouse Community Services Hub is scheduled for April, 2021. The Building Hope vision is guiding the vulnerable out of life storms towards hope. And thankfully during this pandemic, the Lighthouse in partnership with both government and non-government agencies, FaithWorks, the business community, individual sponsorships and two local hotels has been able to shelter 321 men, women, and youth. And of, and of the, those numbers, 104 have found permanent housing. Alleluia. That's the ultimate goal of the Lighthouse, providing hope for the future. As our Lord Jesus Christ said, according to Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 and 36, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. 
I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. The video clip that you're about to watch, More Than a Shelter, provides a brief message from four clients, Todd, Xavier, Chris, and Brenda, about their experience at the Lighthouse. You will hear how these individuals' needs were met and how the Lighthouse supported them during very difficult and challenging times. So as you watch this video, remember, a lighthouse that sits at the edge of the ocean is there for the darkest nights or storms. It guides ships to safety, except the lighthouse itself isn't the final destination. The safety of the harbor is, because no one is disposable. Thank you, Leslie. Um, can you see this? Not yet. No. Not yet. Okay, just sorry. Um, go. Can people see it now? Yes. Okay. My name is Todd Carthew. I got connected about a year and a half ago with the Lighthouse. I was homeless for uh, about eight months after the uh, marriage breakup. I really didn't know that the Lighthouse was in a really until I sort of stumbled upon it. Every staff member greeted me with open arms, uh, uh, fed me as soon as I got there, and um, set me up with, with a bed. Um, which was fantastic because I didn't have anywhere to go. My name is Xavier and I've been hitchhiking across Canada since February. And when I came to Aurelia, I skipped the Toronto uh, highway for hitchhiking. I asked someone on the street if there's somewhere I could grab a meal. And they, they told me to come to the lighthouse and the lighthouse put me up for like, for a um, so the blisters on my feet got to heal, and I got to have food, and, and uh, they gave me some shoes and clothes and everything. I'm Chris, and I was a former um, resident of the uh, Aurelia Lighthouse. They bend over backwards to help people out in regards to a good financial situation to help you get a job. Uh, I've been a resident here for a few times for about 30 to 60 days. If anyone needs assistance in any, in any way, shape, or, or form, I suggest you come down to the living lighthouse. The lighthouse did so many things for me, um, you know, providing me uh, with a bed, uh, providing me with meals, providing me with uh, schedule. They help um, organize um, what I used to have, you know, planning your day, going to meetings, um, housing. Um, you, you have 30 days here, and in that 30 days, you need to, to find some source of, of, of housing. And uh, the, all the staff members here were fantastic in, in helping me, which I did find housing. Um, pretty close to the 30 day mark, which was, uh, which was good. I see the value what the lighthouse is doing now, and I see with this growth of the building and the whole project, I see how it can impact women and men and people in our community so much more. And as a woman that came from a pretty situation, I didn't have that type of help to be, I understand the urgency that we need that type of help, that um, we can't just narrow through such a small amount of help, they need to give us more support now. They can change the life of them. I can't say um, enough um, about what this place means to me. It's a fantastic place.
Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And thank you to the Aurelia Lighthouse. Uh, please remember all of you who are involved in parishes in this diocese, there is a FaithWorks matching grant uh, for parishes for $100,000 between now and the end of 2020. So if parishes raise new monies uh, over and above what they raised last year, it will be matched up to $100,000. So please remember, uh, Speak to your, your priest and remember to donate to FaithWorks through your parish. I would now like to call on Kuchiching Jubilee House. And I think, uh, um, nope, there you are. Uh, sorry, I was about to ask you to unmute and you already had. Is it Lindsay? Uh, hi, no. I'm Paige. And I'm sorry. also joined by Kuchiching. Yes, I'm here as well. You've got both of us because my video streaming is not reliable today. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Paige, my handy right hand is, uh, is going to help us along and be a part of our presentation as well. Okay, great. Um, so if I may, uh, I want to share my screen. We've just put together a little bit of a slideshow just to show some, some pictures of what we're gonna be talking about. So is that okay if I go ahead and do that now? Yeah, uh, will it let you do that? Or do you need me to allow you to do that? Uh, I, I think I can, let me, let me give it a shot. Here, I'm just making you a co-host. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think you should be able to do it. Yep. There we go. Well done. Always such a learning curve with this new way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess three, you can open up. Yep. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Paige and I are both representing Kuching Jubilee House, um, which is commonly referred to in the Aurelia area as CJH. And CJH is a long-term women's transitional home. Um, we serve women age 16 until however long they're with us um, through this area. And we do this by providing a dedicated service to support women in confidential, holistic, and a non-judgmental way. We assist women with meeting their goals based on our following key principles of community partnership, strength-based goal planning, participant-owned and individualized planning. We do so through an unconditional and non-judgmental support system, which include the involvement of professional and volunteer support persons through an intensive collaboration of inclusion, including measurable outcomes. We're committed to the inclusion and empowerment of women regardless of race, gender, age, religion, culture, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or ethnicity. This is a, a very impactful program through the Aurelia area, as well as Simcoe County, because of the intensity of the programs that we're able to offer, both through a residential base, as, along with our outreach services. So Paige is going to speak a little bit now about what those programs are. Hi there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our residential program. So the goal of our program is really to help women um, that are coming from a place of isolation, vulnerability, precarious housing, or near homelessness to a place of community and connection. At the end of our program, women understand their value and have a sense of pride in themselves and their achievements. They have a network of support as they help as they're um, building a brighter and healthier future. So we serve a population in our community that often falls through the cracks. So it's women and children who are not in need of emergency shelter, but who are in precarious housing or near homeless. They need intervention to build life skills and capacity to move on to safe, affordable, and permanent housing. Our program is strength-based and participant-owned, and this is really the core driver of the measurable outcomes and the success of our program. 
We see the most success when individuals are motivated and participate in their growth and development. The benefit of our program is that we can work really closely with our four residents over the span of a year through one-on-one -on -one case management, referrals to critical community resources, assisting them to navigate and access them. And we're really careful to not replicate pre-existing services in our community. We provide pathways to education, employment opportunities, life skills, and mental health supports. And another key component of our program is advocacy. And this really also blends into our outreach program. So in our residential program in the past year, we have served seven women and 11 children. And on average, we have 12 to 15 active women on our wait list. And there's generally a two to three year wait list for the Simcoe County subsidized housing wait list. So moving into our outreach program, our outreach program really encompasses all of the components of our residential co program without the housing component. So we really work closely with women in our community for, to provide food security through good food boxes or through gift cards. We do crisis intervention, safety planning. And in the past year, we've served 280 women in our outreach capacity. And during COVID, we have served 54 individuals. And through our additional community partnerships, we have served uh, 61. And I'm just going to pass this off to Bree just to talk more about our community partnerships. Our community partnerships are key to not only the effectiveness of our programs, but also to the survival and the efficacy of CJH as a whole. We are an incredibly small organization, especially compared to some of the others within the area. However, our role is vital in the sense that it allows us to become much more closely interconnected with those that we serve. So through our partnerships, we do a lot of referral and program sharing with other community services, such as the Lighthouse, Youth Haven, various other parishes and churches through the area, as well as then other access to businesses and direct individuals who have a sense and a drive to help um, these women as well as the community as a whole. One of our big focuses this year being with the COVID landscape is we as an organization, as well as the clients we have served. And I'm sure every person on this call has suffered to some degree, just with the excess stress, the change in the landscape and how we now socialize and the increase in isolation that we're all feeling. So this is where we really turn to organizations like FaithWorks and are so appreciative for their care and support in our in our past as well as in our future in order to allow us to continue to serve those that we serve as well as increase the breadth and the reach for those that we're now serving through this landscape and the challenges that COVID has brought. One of our big goals is to ensure that these relationships continue and that we're able to maintain them regardless of any other challenges that come not only for our culture and our country as a whole but just individually through those that we're serving through this precarious vulnerability in their lives as well. The supports that we receive grants us the abilities to change lives, build futures, and ensure that no one is disposable. All right, I'm just gonna end our screen sharing. Thank you so much to Bree and Paige for that. Um, snapshot of what Cooch Jane Jubilee House is doing. Thank you, Elin. Thank you. I'm going to invite Anne Creighton to uh, read our scripture. Uh, but wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, 
having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hand of the robber? He said, the one who showed him mercy? Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Thank you, Anne. Well, now you get to hear from me for a bit. Um, Wanting to justify himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because lawyers are good at this. I trained as one, so I can say you can see my law degree behind me. Um, we like to split hairs. We like to narrow it down. Not You want to avoid a floodgates. The lawyer wants to, to, to specify to whom do I owe an obligation of care? Because obligations are owed only to neighbors and those who are not seen as neighbors are presumably disposable. You don't have to worry about them. Who's disposable in the Good Samaritan story? As we were thinking about this passage and about this worship service, we started asking ourselves that question. Certainly, it's obvious that the man who falls into the hands of the robbers is disposable. He's left for dead. He's abandoned by his own religious leaders, both the priest and the Levite. The Levite would be like today's church wardens or, or um, you know, choir directors. But the Samaritan who comes to the man's aid is also a member of a group of people who are treated as disposable by the Jewish listeners of Jesus. You'd think that if anyone has an excuse to ignore this injured Jewish man, it would be the Samaritan. If Jews and Samaritans have nothing to do with each other, as it says elsewhere in the Gospels, this man could legitimately say, not my problem. He could claim that he has enough to contend with without getting involved in this person's situation. And yet, perhaps, because of his own experience of exclusion, he is moved to help. Those of us who work in frontline ministry have all seen remarkable demonstrations of generosity from people on the margins. There are also notable expressions of solidarity between groups which have each experienced oppression. This summer, for example, we have seen black and indigenous people coming together to affirm each other's struggles against racism and white supremacy. I've been very, um, privileged and inspired by the Black Anglicans of Canada and their partnership with the Toronto Urban Native Ministry in producing a series of roundtable talks on shared Black and Indigenous pathways. All too often, we have this sense in our society of competing interests or attention, that if we care passionately about one thing or about one group of people, we cannot care about another. But that is a fallacy because we are all connected. As this morning's reading and workshops showed us, we are members of one body. None of us eat without the labor of migrant workers in the fields and grocery store employees. The health of those in hospitals and long-term care homes depends not only upon the expertise of doctors and nurses, but on the working con conditions and quality of life of the caretaking staff. Our economic and social well-being is revealed not so much by the stock exchange, but by whether low-income people can afford food and housing. Nor can we tackle injustice on only one front, when so often different injustices intersect and multiply the effects of each other. It is no accident that anti-racism, immigration issues, the housing crisis, the economic crises, disability issues have all been brought to the fore during this pandemic. To quote Audre Lorde, 
There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. The lawyer in this story is trying to split hairs to establish a hierarchy of concern. But Jesus, in giving the parable a Samaritan protagonist, subverts all such efforts. Everyone is a neighbor. No one is disposable. There is enough solidarity, compassion, and care, enough mercy and justice in the kingdom of heaven for all. There is even enough mercy and justice for the priest and the Levite and the lawyer asking the question. And there is enough mercy and justice for those of us gathered around our computer screens today. In this morning's plenary session, Bishop Peter Fanti personally challenged each of us to take this on, to look around, to stop, to see who am I not hearing? Who am I not seeing? Who am I not being a neighbor to? In showing mercy to and seeking justice for our neighbors, we in turn become the neighbor, remembering ourselves and one another as one body in Christ. Let us go now and do likewise. I would invite uh, Michael Van Dusen, Deacon Michael Van Dusen, to lead us in the following litany. Feeling God, ignite the hearts of all people to act for the benefit of others. Hear our prayers for the repair of all that is broken in our world. May God's peace and justice flow through us. Hear our prayers for the leaders of the nations and all in authority. We especially pray for those of our elected leaders who have it within their power to relieve the suffering of individuals most harmed by the impact of the pandemic. May God's peace and justice flow through us. We confess, O Lord, that we who have remained relatively unscathed by sickness or food insecurity, or a change in employment status, have turned a blind eye to the gross inequities this pandemic has laid on people of color, on indigenous peoples, on people living with disabilities, on those who are homeless, on those who have recently been incarcerated, on those in long-term care facilities, on those in precarious work, on migrant workers. Forgive us. Let us work to tear down barriers and build up communities so that we may be truly reconciled as siblings in our one family of God. God's may God's peace. grace and justice flow through us. God of truth, make us bold in our vision for a society built on honesty and fairness. Bring your truth to bear in all our words so that we may speak peaceably with one another. Inspire us to stand for a world in which people of every race and color and all walks of life share equal access to housing, economic security, health care, a healthy environment, and a well-balanced meal. May God's peace. May God's peace and justice flow through us. Holy One, infuse our lives with your righteousness and love so that we might be generous towards others. Stir in us a prayer for those we see as enemies. Expose the lies that pit neighbor against neighbor, conservative against liberal, settler against indigenous, Christian against Muslim or Jew, us against them. May God's peace and justice flow through us. We call on your name that is above all names. In these days of uncertainty, 
relieve our fears of the continued spread of the virus or the fear of protests or the fear of losing control. By your strength, let us find courage to stare down our fears for the sake of doing what is right. May God's peace and justice flow through us. Lord of creation, renew our sense of Sabbath, where one day of honoring you brings all the other days of the week into alignment with your sacred purpose for all, life, all of life. We give you thanks for your provision for us and for the redemption that you have won for us in Jesus Christ. May God's peace, peace and justice, justice flow through us. We commit all our prayers and the, for the care of the world into the hands of Almighty God in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and who is to come. Amen. Thank you, Michael. We're now going to have a few more FaithWorks um, moments uh, from North House and Aura. Unfortunately, North House couldn't send anybody to um, speak with us today, but Mona Eamon, the executive director, did send me some comments that I can make to introduce the video that they also sent. Uh, North House works in North Durham County to support people who are economically vulnerable and precariously housed. Since COVID started, North, the uh, workers at North House have gone from seeing primarily hidden homelessness in North Durham to an increase in all unsheltered individuals with complex needs. They've also begun to see an increase in isolation and food insecurity among vulnerable seniors. North House has been working to meet those needs through implementing a Housing First program and a Senior Food Box program and continues to explore innovative ways to fill the gaps that COVID-19 has exposed in North Durham. I'm now going to stop sharing this and start sharing the video. Lived in an old farmhouse and for a hundred years ago, did not very well in it. And it was in a large house. I couldn't keep up with everything because my son had just, he was just in recuperating from his second brain tumor remover. And I was the only one to have money coming in the house. And I didn't have enough to support the, the uh, four of us buying the food, paying the rent and the hydro and paying for the propane. The propane was taking two thirds of my money. And I just couldn't, I couldn't keep it up. They were very, very gracious to me. They didn't talk down to me because I didn't have the money. And they were very helpful. They filled up the tank for me and they did help me in good ways too. I'm delighted with the place here. I'm delighted with the
I was nervous and embarrassed, to be quite honest. We'll go on through that and get help, but they helped me out through it, and they didn't seem to judge or anything like that. And everything was still there. Made me feel welcome and, and supported. They helped me with a little bit of financial support with one of my bills. Uh, Lisa helped me with that one. But so, uh, more just emotional support as well. She's called me a few times and I couldn't make much weight. And, uh, just to help me out emotional on that and, and, and to help me to make sure I'm okay and touch base. They've been absolutely fabulous. It was the, um, like you weren't a bad person. You weren't, there was nothing wrong with you because you couldn't afford a house, you know, or an apartment in a regular market. And uh, well, it was from there it all started. And here I am. <laughs> I find I'm not as depressed. I'm more apt to go out every day. I go at least go down to the lobby. And the food bank actually has shelves in the lobby where they keep stock of quite a few things. And they come in every week and they sell it. So if you're stuck for something, you can use it. Um, I mean, to just walk off the street and have someone see you right away. To me, you know, you weren't stewing about it. It was, it was just great. I was living uh, for 20 years over in Caesarea, which is just down the road from here. And uh, I was told that I had to get out of there because he was going to two, two years and a bit ago. When everything was copacetic at that time, and uh, it kind of put my life on the skid, eh, because I had to get really cleaned up and get out of there as quick as I could, sort of deal, like, or as quick as he wanted me to. Eh? And thank God I got through to them because these three days have run the place. Uh, uh, my three angels. They've helped me out a lot. Anyway, and just basically, it took a the pressure off the whole man that really didn't need the aggravation at this stage of his life, if you will. I, I wasn't used to it, that's for sure. And what these people have given me is, uh, is an opportunity to take a breath in between breaths, if you will. And it's just relaxing life. And, uh, I mean, this is where you're supposed to be able to live a little bit. One thing that we realize here at North House is that everyone's struggle is different and every story about how they got to that place in their life is different and part of the culture here at north house is to really be open to listening to those stories and those struggles and then being strong enough when the client isn't strong to be able to help them find solutions for those struggles and overcome them we're working very hard to um, partner with and collaborate with other services, broader services, because often when people are at risk of being homeless or are homeless, homelessness is not their only problem. There are other things that go along with that. And we can help with the housing, but we can't help with other issues. So partnering with and working with other collaborative organizations, individuals in the community, I just like to see those continue to grow and strengthen so that we can provide a, a wide range of services to help change people's lives in a more permanent way. Where I see North House in the next 15 years is really leading the charge for emergency shelters, affordable housing, and transitional housing in the North. As it stands right now in the North, we have none of these things. So I think there is an immediate need. And when we have people that come to see us that need to go to a shelter, for instance, we have to send them down to the city down into Oshawa and they have to leave their community and their friends and I think that that's somewhere we can really make a difference in the north is by leading that charge getting councils on board and the communities on board to see that need. 
just by thinking an awful lot easier, like I say, it's probably uh, made by the existence for, for a guy my age. Eh? And they understand these, my three angels. Uh, they understand because they've just done so much for me. It's wonderful. Eh? And uh, they, uh, they make it a heck of a lot easier for a person to, uh, that's never really been through this type of a, a thing before um, on a long term basis, I would say. Uh, um, they've helped me realize it once in a while. Uh, and uh, they uh, they uh, Thank you. Sorry. Thank you all for your patience. Apparently, we lost sound partway through that. That was um, entirely my fault. <laughs> so um, I apologize. May have been my fault for not hitting the the optimize the video. We have another short video from our friends at Aura, uh, the Anglican United Refugee Alliance, and I will share that now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marin, and I am from Aura. We are a charitable organization in Toronto. Our offices are here at St. Peter St. Simon Anglican Church on Bloor Street, and we do refugee sponsorship for the Anglican Diocese. FaithWorks provides approximately one third of our funding and we in turn help Anglican parishes sponsor refugees. At the end of 2019, we learned that there were 79.5 million people who had been forcibly displaced. That's 1% of the world's population. It can sometimes feel like in light of such massive numbers, there's little we can do to make a difference, but incredible work is being done throughout the diocese to welcome and resettle refugees. Canada is one of the few countries that resettles refugees and every sponsorship begins with an arrival at the airport. So here you can see a couple of pictures of recent arrivals at Aura. On the top left, it's a mother being reunited with her daughter. On the top right, it's cousins. On the bottom right, it's sisters. And on the bottom left, we see some sponsors waiting at the airport. Sponsorship is about welcoming refugees into your community. Oftentimes we pair parishes with community groups or families and they work together to bring and support refugees. This is an Iranian family that was in Turkey. They were uh, chosen, referred for resettlement by the Canadian government and sponsored by a community group working with St. Barnabas Chester. They then went on to partner with their sponsors and sponsor another refugee family. On the right is a family from Eritrea. They were in Uganda. They were sponsored by a collective of churches working together for over 20 years. And in those 20 years, they have sponsored over 20 families. On the top left, we have an Iraqi family. The young man you see on the far left arrived first alone. We then sponsored his father, who you see in the middle, who was reunited with his little grandson. On the bottom left is a Syrian family whose picture was printed onto a cake by their sponsors to celebrate the end of their sponsorship just about a month ago. This is Reverend Pierre, his wife Janine, and their four kids. This is an application that is currently in process. This picture was taken only a week ago. They're in Uganda, originally from Burundi. Reverend Pierre is an Anglican priest himself, and uh, they're being sponsored by St. John York Mills. I had the pleasure this past year to be part of a sponsorship group myself and with a bunch of friends we sponsored uh, Mogos who you see here on the left. And this picture is from a canoe trip we took him on this summer. There's so much we could say about sponsorship but I'll leave it there. Please 
contact us if you'd like some more information. A big thank you to FaithWorks for making our work possible. A big thank you to Elin for all that you do. Please visit our website. Give me a call. You can email me, marin at auraforrefugees.org. We receive so many requests from refugees and families, and we do not have enough sponsor groups. The more sponsor groups we have, the more people we can sponsor to Canada. Thank you very much and take care. Okay, it is now time for us to hear again from Wendy and Daryl. I just wanted to take this moment to say that the scriptures today um, was very enlightening and the readings because it really does bring us home to the forefront where um, we are talking about being a Samaritan and, um, you know, looking at refugees in this country and also having that opportunity to teach in the schools. I think it is so important what you're doing in light of um, reaching out to everyone. So I thank you for that. Um, and I thank you for this opportunity of hearing the word and uh, listening to all those who had a part in this program today. Thank you. Um, this song to me, um, it really fits in because it says, you know, how great thou art because God has brought us through so many struggles, but he's also been so much to us. And in light of what we do, we have to thank him each day that we wake up. So um, I'm just going to do another version of how great thou art. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
as we bring our culture to you, we thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Wendy and Daryl, for your wonderful uh, worship that you have led us in today. We really appreciate you, thank you so much. Is Maggie with us? Yes, she is. Maggie, will you lead us in a, in a blessing? May God grant us the wisdom to discern the body in all fullness, to understand that we are all members together. May God grant us the grace to see our own failings and shortcomings, the way that we have betrayed other members of the body. May God grant us the strength <laughs> to go forward together building up the body in love <laughs> until in each body in creation, the fullness of Christ is complete and fills all in all. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and evermore. Amen. Amen. Deacon Claudette, take us out. Beloved in Christ, go out in peace into the world and live the good news of our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.